Hello Homestead, this is Greg Gillio, principal at Homestead High School and with another uh, installment of our weekly videos uh, based on the uh, submissions from the Rosebud survey, the Rosebud Thorn survey that you have all been uh, responding to. So thank you for all the great responses. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into this week's presentation. Um, so this is uh, September 11th, 2020 uh, and you know, uh, one of the things that we normally do on September 11th is we we talk to the students about uh, remembrances and 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 honoring those who uh, lost their lives on September 11th, uh, 2001, 19 years ago. Um, and I usually speak to the kids. We usually do sort of an announcement or or other things. Um, a little harder to do this year, but I did uh, actually record a video and sent that off to some of the teachers and asked them to use it if they felt comfortable doing that or or even talking about it in their own way so some of your students may be getting the video or getting some of the other uh, remembrances from teachers um, but since I had a moment to talk with you I figured I would share with you kind of what we've talked about in the past um, because again if you look at that date 2001 none of our students were born at that time so this is not something that was in their living memory but it's definitely in ours um, and so uh, this maybe give you a chance to talk about this tonight with you with your uh, students and, and kind of maybe get their reactions to what's going on. Um, but you know, those of you who uh, were alive at this time can have an absolute remembrance of where they were when this event happened. Uh, I was teaching a class uh, in high school when I was an English teacher and um, it, you know, it was a pretty powerful moment and pretty, pretty sad moment. Uh, this is the picture though that a lot of us kind of remember from that day. Um, but what I try to do on this day is it give people a little bit of background. I kind of explain what happened. Uh, and then, but talk about some of the things, the lasting things, some of the positive and hopeful things that are going on today or after in the aftermath. Because again, what happened in the aftermath of this tragic event was that uh, people came together and people supported each other and people uh, wanted to, to create a better place and make people feel safe. And so um, there's a lot of great stories that do come out of this. And so um, what I shared with today on the video uh, was my visit to the 9-11 Memorial last year um, got the chance to go here and this was one of my probably my favorite photos and more memorable uh, moments from that trip. Um, this is the survivor staircase. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know about this, this was a this staircase was the last thing stand in after the buildings fell down um, and it also had served to be an escape route for many people fleeing the building uh, and it provided a level of safety because there was a, a roofing or, or, or awning over it metal awning that actually protected the people as they were getting out of there. So hundreds of people actually owe their lives uh, to the people who made these stairs. And, and again, I think it was just such a fitting um, symbol that, you know, here's something that we all take for granted that, um, you know, you, when you, uh, it, it made me think of the people who built this, that how amazing they must feel to know that their work, uh, while, you know, their original idea was just that it was going to kick people up and down and out of a building, but it really uh, people owe their lives to the, the people who made that. So how powerful that was. So I talk a little bit about that and how we can, you know, use our work and our words and our actions to be a safety net for others and, and asking people to, to kind of honor those who have lost their lives uh, by trying to, you know, be like the staircase and for the people who made the staircase. Um, last year, I talked about the survivor tree, um, which is this beautiful tree that you see there. Um, and this is actually outside the memorial. And there's a plaque there, that's a silver plaque that actually talks about um, the tree. Uh, and what this was, was uh, when they were clearing the rubble, they found this stump of a tree that had a few green leaves on it. They said, you know, this tree isn't dead yet, even though it's been burned and broken and smashed. Um, and they carefully uh, removed it took it to a nursery and, and nursed it back to health. And this is what it looks like now. And they brought it back nine years later uh, when the memorial went up. And uh, just what a hopeful thing this is, that what a beautiful tree that has, has, you know, people took the time and effort to save this tree um, uh, to, to, as, an, as a, a memorial or honoring those who, who lost their lives that day. There's millions of other things, other stories that are really fantastic and powerful and sad at the same time. But this was last year's story. Um, the staircase was this year's story. Um, so again, maybe a chance for you to talk to your kids uh, about this moment or, or even think and reflect on your own about um, what it meant at that time and what it means now today. Because again, we're living through some troubled times. Um, and so uh, maybe these stories can be something to help you a little bit too. So ho hopefully uh, uh, this was helpful for you. So wanted to move on though to our roses, buds and thorns. Um, again, in this survey and this survey, there's a link uh, to the email in the email blast that came out and hopefully that's how you got here. and. You got the, the link to this, but there is the surveys in that link as well. Um, 
And so again, we ask you to send in your roses, things that you want to sh give shout outs or thank yous for, the, uh, your suggestions or ideas, which we call buds, or your questions or concerns, which we call thorns. So starting with our roses, um, here are a few. So the uh, first one goes out to Dan Usum, who is our trainer and health clerk. Um, this is a long description about just how helpful he is uh, and how he goes out of his way to be helpful and to do things, even if it's not necessarily in his area, uh, he's just there to help. And so that was uh, what people wanted, this person wanted to give him a rose for. Um, this next one was for Miss Escovel, who is our guidance secretary. Uh, and I'm quoting here again for her professionalism, help, helpful spirit, and follow through. And again, we agree she's a super uh, great source to have in our office, very cheerful and, and, and fun and positive. And, and we see what a great help she is to our guidance counselor. So I'm glad to see that she's also uh, reaching through to parents. Um, staying with our guidance department, we had a shout out for Mrs. Ogawa Boone, who is our counselor for students uh, with the last names S-A-N through Z. Um, and again, quoting the parent that sent this in, she is detailed in her explanations, responsive, friendly, and super helpful. Um, again, we could, all, we could also agree with that one. And so uh, thank you for recognizing uh, Ms. Ogawa Boone. Uh, the next one goes into our math department. Actually, the next two are math teachers, but uh, Ms. Vakili. Uh, as our math teacher. And this was uh, another quote where, again, this parent talked about um, enjoying just the calmness and, and the, the compassion that she hears in this teacher's voice uh, when she's kind of overhearing her student in class. Um, and, and the quote I took out of there was, during these crazy times and with all the anxiety students are feeling, it's nice to hear her teach. And I know that's not something we hear a lot, but that, 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 that was just a very touching statement right there. It's nice to hear her teach, and, and I agree. She's a, she's a great person, a great teacher. Uh, Mr. Southern, again, another math teacher for his quick responses, patience, and consideration. Um, so uh, again, thank you to the math department for doing all that great work. Uh, and then there was also um, just a generic uh, thank you to all the admin and staff who are working to make distance learning as good as it can be. And, and this person acknowledging that it's been a struggle for everybody, but uh, appreciating the improvements that have been made and the, the, the lengths that everyone's going to this year. So those are our roses for today. Um, our buds, which are again, our ideas, suggestions or brainstorms. Um, one parent was asking about, um, you know, asking teachers to use more wait time or, or the raise hand emoji to make sure that everyone who wants to say something says something. Um, or is able to say something and that sometimes it's a little harder to participate in Zoom and maybe people are feeling a little reluctant. So just trying to encourage uh, uh, teachers to do that. And again, I do share this video with the teachers too. So um, this will get right to them. So I'm throwing it right out to them. Um, there was a suggestion about cons would we consider any outdoor social events like a ball game or a barbecue to build community and social connections? Uh, I think it, I'm there to say that everybody would like to do something like that. But unfortunately, we are not permitted by the county orders that are out there to do anything like this. So as soon as it's safe, as soon as we're able to, yes, we will immediately get back to these things because this is really a huge part of our uh, what we do at high school. Um, you know, it is about the learning and, and class, but it's also the huge social uh, environment that goes with school um, that makes it so great. So as soon as we can, we will. But again, we're, we're trying to make some half steps to it. You know, we have a virtual rally that our leadership students are putting on next week. Uh, so again, hopefully that builds up some spirit and a fun way to, to do some rally and some connectivity. Um, we did have a virtual club fair last night on September 10th that was recorded. So you will get a chance to see that if you haven't seen it, it's on the ASB website. But again, that was to encourage students to join other clubs. We have over 70 clubs on campus. Again, it's a great way to make connections and to meet other students. Um, we are starting to, you know, branch out and use our student activity period, which is the last part of on, on Wednesdays, uh, where clubs can meet and activities can happen. Um, and we also are trying to do a lot of connectivity or connection or get to know you types of activities and advisory as well, because again, we, we will do some whole campus lessons there, but getting the chance to know others is, is really key. And so those are some of the things we're trying to do while we're waiting to get cleared. And I am going to talk a little bit more about the monitoring list and, and, and what the recent county um, movement was. So I'll talk about that towards the end, but I'll get back to that in a minute. There was a, a, a question about could we or a suggestion about switching office hours to earlier in the day as it might be more helpful for students. Um, as I mentioned last week that you know, it is while well, on paper, it might be easy to move things around. Um, we have an agreed upon uh, schedule across the district and, and I alone can't change something. Um, you know, we, you know, we will, we've talked to parents and students and, and staff about what was kind of the best way we could get there. This is the solution we came up with. It may or may not be perfect, um, but at this point we really can't switch or arbitrarily switch something because it might be helpful for one person or another. Um, so again, I, while those might be some good suggestions, there's really not anything we can do about that at this time. 
Uh, there was a suggestion about could we bring some therapy animals to campus to re because they help reduce stress uh, when we do return it. And you know, actually, this is something we've tried to do the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, it was uh, therapy goats. Uh, and we were also trying to get like, you know, baby animals or puppies kind of thing at one point. Um, the hardest part about this is really is getting uh, the clearance and the insurance to cover this because one of the big issues that we have on schools is as students who have allerg allergies to animals. And so you have to be very careful about that. Uh, and bringing animals, mixing animals with kids can have some potential issues. So we definitely have to have some agreements and, and uh, uh, insurance from those who are bringing it. So it, it's something we've tried to do. It doesn't always work, but we're still looking at it. It's something that we definitely want to do. And I think we could all use, you know, a, a petting zoo or a puppy or a therapy goat to help us at this time. So we're definitely going to be looking at that as, as when we come back. Um, there was a, a suggestion about making sure teachers are giving more breaks during Zoom. Uh, you know, you've all heard the terms about Zoom fatigue, it is definitely real. It is definitely something that uh, we're trying to deal with. And I think, again, as we're moving along, teachers are trying to get a read on the students and see when they do need breaks, or if they can give breaks. Um, so, you know, again, one of the things we're just concerned about is losing students when we give breaks. So sometimes they go away and they don't come back. So we want to make sure that we're not losing anybody because this is a tough enough environment as it is. But yeah, we're, we're looking for ways to give breaks or to do different things that might, you know, allow students to not just be stuck in front of the camera the whole time. So that's our list of buds today. We have a few pages of thorns, but that's pretty much normal. We definitely have lots of questions and concerns that come up. This, these first couple uh, are really all about workload and home workload. Um, so I've kind of grouped them together, but um, there was a, a statement in one of the, the thorns about, hey, I really like advisory, but teachers appeal to be piling on homework on Wednesdays. Um, and so this, you know, this is about the homework load, right? That there is a, 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 the agreement that with a more rigorous and robust uh, in instructional environment with this remote learning that that does include more homework to getting back to sort of closer to what we did uh, in pre COVID times. Um, but we are trying to adjust some of that and trying to figure out whether we're given too much or not enough. So getting some of the feedback is important for us. Um, but again, one of the big issues with um, homework is, you know, it, it, the teacher may think, hey, I'm, I'm assigning a half hour, an hour, and if your kid is spending two, three, four hours on it, that could be a potential sign of an issue, right? They, maybe they're struggling and they need some help, or maybe they're overdoing it. Um, so having the student talk to the teacher, having, you know, you send an email to the teacher asking like, hey, my kid's doing a lot of homework. Um, can, can we talk about this? Um, you know, that's, that's something that, again, teachers want to hear back and want to be able to help support your student because they don't want them to be spending hours and hours of homework. We, we know that homework is one of the big stressors. Uh, and, and in remote learning, um, it even feels like a bigger stressor because it, it may feel like you don't have anybody else to turn to. Um, but that's also why we created the Wednesday to be an asynchronous day that, you know, it is about doing work on those days. It is about giving kids a chance during the school day to be working on things. And I know some people say, oh, I only have one class that day and it's, a, it's advisory. And so it's kind of like a day off. It is not a day off. It is meant to be a work at home and asynchronous day the kids to get doing work on those days. So again, I can feel, I can understand why people might think, oh, there's a bunch of homework coming on that day, but that's because that's a day meant for asynchronous work or homework or group work or any of that kind of stuff. And again, if you see the bottom one there, uh, that learning time, which is a little bit of what they're talking about, this one period during the day, it's learning time. And that is time where we have said, you don't have to go to class, but you should be working on something. You should be doing your homework. You should be talking to your groups. You should be making up a test or a quiz or whatever happens. You know, there's lots of things like that that can be going on. Now, again, if students choose to go to advisory and go back to bed and then not get up till later and not do their homework till six or seven o'clock at night, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, they're going to be staying up late to finish their homework. So this is a, a chance to get them to get the work done and not have to stay up super late at night to, to finish their homework. Um, so again, a couple more things about, hey, there's too much homework going on. Again, please talk to that teacher. They may have some suggestions or a fix. Uh, what we're also noticing is some people who are, are concerned about the amount of homework are in honors and AP courses, which will have more homework. Uh, that's the nature of them. An, an honors class is a, a, a college prep class that goes deeper and, and, and requires more of you. And an AP course is a college level course. Um, so there is a lot more work and that needs to be done and covered. And so you are going to get a larger amount there. But if, you know, if your student is spending hours and hours on college prep homework um, or outside of honors or AP courses, then that might be a reason. There might be something going on there. So you want to check with the teacher. Um, if your kid is an AP and honors, yeah, that's what they signed up for. That's what we talk about in terms of balance making sure they do it. Um, again, another, another uh, thorn or two came up about the workload during class time. It seems to be a lot of work going on. Um, 
you know, this is where we're really trying to, to calibrate here, right? You know, last semester, you know, there, there were concerns that we weren't doing enough and we probably felt like we weren't doing enough and we wanted to get back to a, a more rigorous and robust environment. And so we are adding in more work, more instruction, more time in front of the camera, more time with the class than we did last year. So, you know, there, there definitely is an increase in that, but we are, we are learning and, and trying to calibrate and say, hey, is this too much? Is this not enough? Um, we're trying to really, do, and Schoology hasn't helped in that either. You know, Schoology has a, a different organizational system to it. People are still getting used to it, so it might take them longer to get through it. Um, so again, teachers are looking at that, but if your kid feels like they're being overwhelmed, a great idea to talk to a counselor or a teacher uh, to try and get some information about that. And again, I, I talked about the learning time here, but again, knowing that, again, the stress that homework creates, we really want to create that, that Wednesday to give you your students more time to work. Um, moving on to some more just generalized questions. Um, someone was, a uh, parent was upset about, you know, assuming, you know, when teachers say, I want you to take this assignment, print it off, take the work, do the work, take a picture and scan it back in that, you know, you can't always assume that the family has a, access to a printer and that's true. Um, so if, if that's something that comes up when a teacher says, hey, I need you to print this off, please let the teacher know saying, hey, we don't have a printer. Um, it's not going to hurt you academically. <clears throat> We're going to find other ways to get you that source. And we've had things where people have kind of, you know, swung, swung by school to get something after we've arranged to get it picked up or um, other ways that we can, we can get you that, that uh, material. So, so don't, uh, do, you know, make sure you talk to the teacher and then we can try and set something up. Um, there was a question about um, this, you know, a parent was concerned that this specific teacher that their student had uh, wasn't giving enough information about the units that were coming up. Uh, they say, well, this is the one unit we're working on now, but they want to know what's coming up in the future. Uh, again, great question to email to the teacher and say, hey, you know, what are some of the future things coming up? Although I can tell you one of the things that teachers are concerned about is making sure kids are focusing on the here and now and they're not trying to race ahead because uh, students try to do their best and they try to get an advantage on it. And so, you know, there are things that, and especially in science and math, that build upon each other. So jumping ahead doesn't necessarily help. Um, also, uh, you know, some, it might be a deeper dive that you need to do just by looking at Schoology. Uh, if you go into those accounts and start saying, well, what else does it, has the teacher posted? What else is in there? Um, but we're also trying to limit the amount of information going through Schoology because we've had a lot of concerns from parents and students that there's too much information on Schoology. So we don't want to lay out months and months of work and, and kind of stress people out in that regard. Uh, so it is a balancing act. Um, there is one person complained about too much information coming home. Can we please reduce the thing they felt like an overload? And, and um, you know, I, I guess if I'm going to be guilty of something, I would rather be guilty of over communicating than under communicating. Um, so I, I get this, I understand, but you might want to kind of pick and choose which avenues you're going to listen to. In all honesty, everything you need to know about Homestead, upcoming events, all those things, all on our website. We have a huge website. It might be a little hard to navigate where, because you're like, there's so much there, where do I find something? But it's all there. Um, so that could be a place where, you know, you just focus on that. Maybe you just focus on the weekly email blast that this email or that this video in, came in, because um, it is a great sort of recap of what's going on and what's happening. Um, it's followed up on Monday with sort of like what's happening this week. Um, so Friday you get the, you know, big kind of things and then Monday's a little bit more focused on that week. Um, but we also will send out special event emails when we need to make sure everyone knows that, hey, back to school night was last night or, you know, course selection paperwork is due, that kind of stuff. So we will do those as well. One area where maybe you can control the information coming and going, or maybe really coming, is in, uh, in Schoology. Uh, there are places to, uh, to eliminate or reduce the notifications that you're getting. So if you have every single notification set on, um, you're going to get a million things. <laughs> so, you know, I, I quickly learned that lesson that if you if you have too many notifications, your email box gets filled. So uh, you might want to reduce that and, and you know, or, or streamline it a bit so that you're not getting overwhelmed with that. But um, we're probably not going to reduce the, the avenues of things sending out. Um, but we do understand that you may want to, you know, it's okay to pick one or two of these and just say, I'm going to focus on that. And that's about as enough information for that I can handle. Um, Moving on, uh, next page of thorns here. So um, we've had a couple questions where, you know, parents says, hey, my kid's technology failed and, and they weren't and they weren't able to get into class. They got kicked out of class. Um, are those absences, if they never get back into class or they leave, you know, they're never, you know, kind of thing, they can't get in or they're never able to, to get back in. Um, is that an excused absence? Um, and this is a little bit more complicated than simply saying something is excused or unexcused because we don't determine what is an excusable or unexcusable, unexcused absence. That's really the state of California. They say these three or four things are what constitute a, an excused or an unexcused. So for instance, 
you're sick, your parent calls in, that's an excused absence. Um, you decide to go on a college uh, visit somewhere and your, your parent calls in and says, hey, we're taking Friday to go down to UC Santa Barbara. That is not an excused absence. This, the state of California doesn't recognize that as excused. However, we verify that absence. And so that's a key term. So when a parent calls in and says, this is what's going on, we make a special notation that says, okay, this, this is an unexcused absent, but the parent called to verify it. So the kid isn't just cutting school and going hanging out at the beach at Santa Cruz, they're actually doing something. And so that's significant to the teacher because it tells them, yes, I can give them makeup work or I'm allowed to give them pre-work so they can get things done so they don't fall behind. If it's unexcused, if it's a cut, um, then we don't have to give them makeup work um, and we don't have to allow them to make up tests and that kind of stuff. So it is a very key thing. Now, in terms of technology, um, that also doesn't fall under the excused absence thing, but we are verifying those. So it is important that if your kid can't get in, they email their teacher saying, I can't get in, or the, but more importantly, the parent either emails the teacher, but the parent needs to contact the attendance office because then we will code it as one of those verified absences and it will not count against your student's truancy count. So again, if your kid is cutting all the time, legitimately cutting, going, you know, feeling like I don't, I just don't want to go to class today, there are going to be consequences down the line. Uh, this one doesn't count towards it. If you got booted because you lost internet or you know, your your computer died, that's not going to to get it. But you know the the, the kind of <laughs> running joke right now is that you know tech problems are sort of the new the dog ate my homework. Um, so we really want to make sure that that isn't just being used as a flippant excuse. Um, but if it does happen, please make sure parents verify it for us so that we can make sure it doesn't hurt the kid and they can get the makeup work and get back on it. So um, so communication is key in this one. Uh, there was another question saying, hey, this one teacher uh, makes our kids uh, type uh, in an AP class, type the answers on the test. And, and since uh, I'm not reading this well, but can a certain teacher allow students to handwrite answers since the AP test does not require students to type? Um, you know, again, we, we this if there's an issue with the typing going on, then maybe you, that's a good question that the student should or parent can sit down with the teacher and say, my student's struggling with this uh, or it's, it's taking too much time or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, we do follow the AP curriculum, but we don't align our entire class to just be about the test, right? The test is a significant thing and, 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 and uh, piece of data that we get from that, but it isn't what the class is really about. The class is about learning. It's about doing different things. So there are different ways that kids can take tests. And so um, just because the AP tests, uh, they don't require students to type, although uh, that's changed recently because you know AP tests are all online now, so I can't imagine that they're they're doing much handwriting. Although I know there is some of that, um, but again, there is a lot more typing going on, so that is one of the things. It's just easier to do on a computer. So um, again, uh, but that is one of those specific conversations you probably want to have with the teacher if your if your student is struggling with that, and not it's just it's a preference they would rather handwrite it. Again, we we need to make sure that we're we're pushing kids in the right directions. Um, the big question that I got here was like, now that Santa Clara County has moved off the monitoring list, when will we return to in-person learning? And this is the million dollar question. Um, and for those of you who didn't hear, um, you know, we are moved from purple to red, which basically means we're off the monitoring list. And when the governor said schools are going to be in remote learning, unless they're off this remote uh, list, what basically was saying is there's a, there's a, a measurement uh, and you have to be off of that. This county has to be after 14 consecutive days. Uh, it can't be two days here and then three days on and two days off and you start counting that as five. Um, it's gotta be 14 in a row. And as, as I started recording this this morning, we were up to day three, we still got you know 11 more days to go. So who knows if we fall back off, you know, we haven't really gotten any sort of hits or indication from what happened over Labor Day, but that could be coming soon because every time we've had a big holiday, there's been spikes. Um, so that could push us right back onto the monitoring list. Uh, but but again, um, let's say we, we get the 14 straight days. What the, what the ruling says is that school districts may start to uh, move back to remote learning, not that they have to return back to learning on that exact day. But the reason why it's a may is the county is going to come back to us and say, hey, we're going to, there are these guidelines and restrictions that you're still going to have to live under. It is highly unlikely that after 14 days, you know, let's say the next 14 days, they're going to say everybody can come back to school, no restrictions, no guidelines, just do school as normal. It's probably not going to happen. Um, what they are going to say is you can go back to school, but you have to be wearing these kinds of PPE. You have to do these kinds of safety protocols. You have to you know, this is the amount of number of kids that can be in a room together or in an event together. So it's really going to then determine, like, can we can we do that? Can you know, that was one of the struggles with the hybrid earlier was that some of the restrictions made it very, very hard for us to have 
a, a decent amount of kids on campus so that we could progress learning at a decent moment. But so we have to wait and see, we'll get off the list, see what the county then says. Um, and then what we have to also look at is where are we in the semester? Um, you know, if it's relatively early in the semester, that would make an easier switch. If we're closer to the end, it might not make sense to, you know, just stick through all the way to the end of the semester and start up at the beginning of the next semester. Um, so again, those, all of those things are really going to start to, you know, be part of the, the calculus of how we come back to school and when we come back to school. Um, but also what I need to make sure uh, people understand is that we could be right back in remote learning, even with all the greatest things, if we start having positive COVID tests uh, at school with students and staff. The, uh, the number, the target there is if you have 5% of students or staff um, you know, that, that end up uh, having positive COVID tests. And so when you're talking about 2,400 students, you know, that's a decent amount. That's 100 or so or more kids. When you're talking about staff, that's a, not as many. We only have about 160 staff members here. So um, 180 if you count our evening and, and coaches and that kind of stuff. But um, again, it, it really is going to depend. And, and so we could be back on remote learning even though we're off of the monitoring list. So there's so many answers and questions that I really don't have the answers to that, um, you know, it's going to take a while for us to figure out how to do some of that. So again, our hope is to get back to, you know, in-person learning as quickly and as safely as we can. And some of those steps are really going to help us determine uh, where we are and where we go. So this brings us to our last slide of the presentation. And just again, some quick and important pieces of information for you to know. Last night, the, the 10th, uh, was our back to school night. It was done all through video. Those videos are still available on Schoology. Um, again, we chose to go with videos rather than Zoom because, you know, our teachers are and your students are on camp are on and you are on Zoom all day long doing business and work and school and then doing several more hours of Zoom in the evening just felt like that was going to be way too much. Um, so we went, the whole district went with, let's do uh, videos for our teachers. Those are located on your Schoology pages. Um, you should be able to access through those those through your parent um, your parent uh, account. And so you go on there, you'll see your name up in the right corner. You click on that. Your student's name should be underneath that. You click on your student's name, and then it'll help take you through the classes. If for some reason that's not working and you're not getting access that way, ask your student to log in as themselves, and then you can go to each of their classes. Um, and if you have any issues after that, you can go ahead and email the teachers too and say, can you just send it directly to me? Um, uh, but there's other ways that folks are posted to. Some have posted it to YouTube. We posted some videos on YouTube. Uh, this, these videos always end up on YouTube, so that's also a good place to check. Um, but uh, also, they talked about that virtual club fair. It is on the. It was recorded last night. It is on the ASB website. So if you get a chance to get check that out, please do so, or have your kids check it out. Um, here's my plug for the PTSA. Always doing great stuff for us. They've done a few information panels. Uh, they did one on technology the other night. They did one about athletics and activities. Uh, and they, we did one about parent mentorship. Um, so there's a lot of different ones that are out there. Uh, go, to the, go to the PTSA uh, page on our website and you, you'll see more information and more connections to um, some of these um, uh, events. Uh, and just a, a quick shout out that they're gonna be also hosting a, a night with our superintendent, uh, which will be on the, uh, September 23rd. And then we'll be talking about the, the partial tax that's coming up on the, on the November ballot, as well as other things that are going on across the district. Um, and also there's a couple of guidance presentations coming up in the next couple of weeks. So our guidance team is going to be going out and not going out, but zooming out to talk to seniors on 916 uh, during that, that's a Wednesday during that uh, learning time where students can come in and they'll get presentations about upcoming uh, in academic information that will be important for them. And then there'll be a presentation for our ninth grade students on uh, the 23rd. Again, these are for students, they're, they're counselors directly to the students, but you know, again, if you want to kind of ask your students, hey, how'd that presentation go today? Um, they'll probably say, how did you know? And you can make that our little secret, but you can, I'm telling you there's stuff going on. So you might want to ask them how those are. And, and a lot of times if you go to our website and go under the guidance department, you'll see their presentations, uh, the, the PowerPoints there. So you can also get some more information that way. Um, so again, thank you guys for, for hanging out with us and for listening here and for putting in our, our Rosebud Thorn uh, responses. Please send us more. Um, and we will get the information for next week's video together. So thank you, everybody. Have a, a, a great Friday. Please take care and stay safe out there. The weather uh, is, is cooler, but the air quality is horrible. So please be careful with that. And again, please remember to be safe wearing a mask and washing your hands and, and setting a good example for your students. So again, appreciate everybody uh, watching the video through and uh, hope you have a great weekend.